Hey you, do you like DOS games? Are you disappointed that DOS supporting sound cards no longer fit in your PC? And do you have no idea what DOSBox is and never plan to? Well, this is the video for you. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you'll know that finding modern hardware to run DOS games on has been a bit of an obsession of mine for the last few years. This obsession has taken me on a journey through late 90s computer hardware to weird exotic industrial motherboards and even building mini DOS gaming PCs using embedded industrial modules. But this video is arguably the logical conclusion to my journey. Today we're going to be talking about Project Disappointment, a device that lets you add an ISA slot to a modern PC, put a sound card in it, and play DOS games like it's 1996 again. Let's get going. This video is brought to you by PCBWay, more about them later. Before we get started, let's take a look at the history of the ISA slot. The ISA slot was introduced with the very first IBM PC, released in 1981. This was the main system bus of the PC, and as such was used for pretty much everything. Graphics cards, floppy and hard drive controllers, serial and parallel ports, and even memory came on ISA cards, and naturally ran on the same 4.7 MHz clock as the 8088 processor. In 1984, IBM released the PC AT, which came with an 8 MHz 286 processor. As a consequence, the AT's slots ran at 8 MHz and had 36 extra pins to cope with the wider data and address buses of the 286. But they were largely backwards compatible with cards made for the original PC. As processors got even faster, the system bus became too fast for older ISA cards, so later 286-based machines decoupled the ISA slots from the system bus and ran it at 8 MHz no matter what the processor clock speed. Throughout the 90s, PCI devices slowly replaced ISA ones in most applications, but ISA slots hung around for a few more years, largely because of DOS games and sound cards. DOS games expect the sound card to be in an ISA slot, and although PCI slots are somewhat software compatible with ISA slots, the way they do DMA is completely different. These games were still popular until long after Windows became standard issue, so a vestigial ISA slot was often present on consumer motherboards even in the late 90s, still usually running at 8 MHz, even when when the processor might be running at over 2 GHz. Unfortunately, as DOS gaming declined, so did the ISA slot. By the early noughties, very few consumer motherboards contained an ISA slot, and the only places you'll see one today are on exotic industrial motherboards running much older processors. If you want an ISA motherboard that can take anything more recent than a Core 2 processor, then you're out of luck. As an aside, there are actually some ISA to USB adapters available, like this open source ISA STM project, which admittedly looks very cool, but they don't really add an ISA slot to your computer in the traditional sense. Normal ISA slots are actually mapped into the PC's I.O. memory space, and DOS games access them by directly reading or writing to these addresses. ISA to USB adapters simply allow you to control an ISA card over USB. No memory or I.O. mapping is performed. This means that programs have to be written specially to access the USB bus, which rules out all DOS games that I'm aware of, as DOS doesn't even support USB. So on virtually all motherboards made in the last 20 years or so, you can no longer install an ISA sound card, and thus no longer play DOS games with audio, except by using an emulator like DOSBox. And what self-respecting DOS gamer would settle for that? However, there's an often forgotten part of the ISA story, and that's LPC. You see, around the time ISA was being replaced by PCI, Intel realised that it needed a simple bus to handle legacy lower speed devices like serial and parallel ports and floppy disk drives. This bus would need to behave like the ISA bus so that software wouldn't need to be rewritten, but use far fewer signals than the nearly 100 required for ISA. So they came up with the LPC bus, a simple interface that only uses around a dozen signals, but implements essentially all the features of ISA. The LPC bus was included on pretty much every PC from then on. If you're watching this video on a PC, then it's almost certain that it has an LPC bus hidden inside the motherboard somewhere, and it's this bus that is the salvation of bare metal DOS gaming on modern motherboards. You see, when I said the LPC bus behaves like the ISA bus, I really mean it. As far as DOS games are concerned, the LPC bus might as well be an ISA bus. IO ports, memory, IRQ and DMA all behave exactly the same way on a modern LPC bus as they did in the first ever IBM PC in 1981. Now, if you've seen the video a few months back where I built a super fast DOS gaming PC, you'll know about the Portwell Ruby 9719 motherboard, which, as far as I know, was until today the fastest known motherboard that still supports ISA well enough to run a sound card. It does this by using a bridge chip manufactured by FinTech that converts the LPC bus into a full ISA bus. So the thought occurred to me, what if we take this chip and attach it to a more modern motherboard? 
Well, a few months of tinkering and we have the disappointment. An LPC to ISA bridge chip on a board that can theoretically be attached to any motherboard with an LPC bus. But how do we get at the LPC bus, given it's not intended to be accessible to the end user? Well, we could attempt to find the signals on various via holes and test points on the motherboard, and I've had some success with that approach on certain computers such as this Dell laptop here, but it's not exactly reasonable to expect someone to do that just to play DOS games. Well, that brings us to the final piece of the puzzle, the TPM header. Trusted platform modules were introduced in the mid noughties and are hardware encryption keys that allow services like BitLocker and Secure Boot and whatnot. But because TPMs are simple devices, they connect over the LPC bus, so the TPM header exposes some or all of the LPC signals on a nice easy pin header connector. This means that, with the help of the disappointment, you can connect a 30 year old sound blaster to your PC's TPM header and play bare metal DOS games like it's 1993. Except on a computer several thousand times more powerful. Let's get started. Now, the first thing to do is get hold of a disappointment. I'm considering selling these at some point in the future, but for now you'll have to build one yourself. It's not a super hard circuit to assemble, but you'll need to be able to handle relatively fine pitch surface mount work. I would, of course, recommend buying the circuit board itself from PCBWay, who kindly offered to make mine. If you're a first time user, then you'll get $5 off your first order. They also do assembly services for as little as $30 for up to 10 boards, and they'll even source all the components for you. I'm working with them to offer the disappointment board as a pre-assembled item, so stay tuned for more information on that. PCBWay also now offer very reasonably priced low volume CNC machining and 3D printing services. I recently tried out their 3D printing service and the results were amazing. The quality of the resin prints was great. They also do lots of other stuff like injection molding and sheet metal fabrication, so hit them up if any of that sounds useful to you. Anyway, parts wise, most can be ordered from Mauser. The bridge chip might be slightly tricky to get hold of, but I found stock on AliExpress. You'll also need an ATX power splitter, because the disappointment needs a lot of different voltages that are only present on the ATX connector. Those can be got on eBay easily enough. The next thing to do is find a suitable motherboard. The best candidates are Intel chipsets with an I.O. controller hub or platform controller hub all the way up to the Series 9 platform controller hub. So anything up to about socket 2011, which theoretically means Broadwell processor should work. Anyone fancy building a $9,000 24-core DOS gaming machine? Anything newer than that probably won't work, as Intel dropped DMA support starting with the 100 series chipset. AMD chipsets can probably be made to work, but we'll need the initialization program changed. I'll update the video description with more information about that when I get a chance to investigate it. The motherboard will also obviously need to have a TPM header, but not all TPM headers are created equal. There's a lot of different pinouts out there. If you're lucky, there will be a pinout listed in the manual for your motherboard, and it will be identical to the pinout of the disappointment. This means that you can probably connect them together using a simple 20 pin IDC ribbon cable. If you're less lucky, the pinout will be different, and you'll have to either use female to female DuPont wires to manually wire up the correct signals to each other, or make your own custom ribbon cable. You only have to wire up one ground, though. If you're unlucky, some of the signals we need will be missing from the TPM header. This means you might have to dig the missing signals out from elsewhere on the motherboard. The procedure will vary massively between motherboards, but just as an example, I'll show you what I had to do on a couple of my motherboards. This Foxconn one was actually pretty easy. The pinout was nearly identical to the disappointment, but it was missing the LDRQ signal on pin 20. Using a multimeter, I found that pin 20 connects to this unpopulated resistor here, which in turn connects to pin 38 of this Super I.O. chip over here. Looking up the datasheet of the Super I.O. chip indicates that that pin is LDRQ. All I had to do to enable LDRQ on the TPM header is put a blob of solder across the unpopulated resistor pads, then disconnect the LDRQ pin of the Super I.O. chip by lifting it up with a soldering iron so that it didn't interfere. This gigabyte board was a little more involved. The pinout is also very similar, even though the stupid way everything is listed in the manual makes it look like it's completely different, but instead of LDRQ we have a completely different signal. Luckily, I managed to obtain schematic and board view files from, uh... Well, I acquired it legally. It can be Sure of that. And discovered LDRQ1 is connected to this unpopulated resistor here. So I soldered some wire to it, ran it over to near the TPM port, and attached a pin header. Then I manually wired everything up with DuPont wires. I realized I could have done a neater job by disconnecting pin 20 from the TPM header and wiring LDRQ in instead, but this is fine for testing. Okay, that's the hard part over. Now we have everything connected up, we can boot the PC into DOS, or in my case, Windows 98 in DOS mode. Um, I've written a little utility to configure the LPC bus and ISA bridge. It's called Safisa, short for Sapphire ISA, because Sapphire is one more than Ruby, you get it? If you run it without arguments like I've done here, then it will by default 
bolt forward ports that are useful for sound cards like this Sound Blaster 16 to the LPC bus so that they end up being forwarded to the disappointment. Now we just need to initialize the sound card. I'm going to set it up to use IRQ7 because uh, I find that IRQ5 seems to have problems on these modern boards. So um, I don't know why that is, but I'm sure there's a good reason for it. And then if your sound card needs initialization like this Sound Blaster 16 does, uh, you need to run the initialization program after this. Yeah, Unisound, and it's moved it to IRQ7, so that's good. All right, let's try Doom. Hey! Should have plugged in a mouse. <laughs> Forgotten how difficult it is to play with just a keyboard. Everyone's favorite meatball, apart from the pain elemental, of course. All right, now we've got some settings that work. We can stick them in uh, autoexec.bat so they uh, automatically get run every time we start the computer. Okay, the procedure is C, Safisa, Safisa.exe, set blaster A220i7d1. And then finally, C, drivers, unisound. Wonderful. Reboot and see if it works. Fantastic. Whoa! Quake doesn't work at all! Just making a nasty noise. Try some talkie games. Isn't she something? She can go on for hours. I bet she does. Try some other games with audio. Yeah. Well, this seems to work. Yeah, this seems okay. Wolfenstein seems to work fine. Weirdly, I always feel bad about killing these dogs, but never the ones in Quake. So I've replaced the motherboard with the Foxconn motherboard, and the sound in Quake was still totally messed up. Then I replaced the sound card with another Sound Blaster 16, and it also didn't work, but um, I've replaced it with this Crystal Semiconductor-based card, and... Yeah, everything seems fine. Yep, getting perfectly good audio, so, uh, yeah. Plugged a mouse in now, so let's see if I can remember how to do this. Whoops. Oh, I'm gonna die, aren't I? Yep. Whoops. Shambler, 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 shambler. I do not have enough <laughs> health for this rocket jump. Yeah, definitely not. <laughs> Thinking of submitting to GDQ this year, what do you think? Some lemmings next, maybe? <laughs> for high performance PCs. I wonder if this qualifies. I swear this is running slightly slower than I expected. Like the music's even going slower, I think. Lemmings running slower isn't necessarily a bad thing, especially in the later levels. Oh no, I have no idea what to do in this level. I'll just nuke them and try again. Kablamo. Anyway, I could sit and play DOS games forever, but I think we've proven that it's working. So, what's next for this project? Well, firstly, I'd very much like to investigate how well AMD motherboards cope with this LPC bridge chip. I'm not aware of any motherboards that have one built in, but it certainly seems like AMD processors up to and including Socket AM4 models still support the LPC bus. Unfortunately, Socket AM5 processors seem to have ditched it, but AM4 is still pretty modern by my standards. Secondly, I'd love to see if it's possible to get ISA sound cards working on modern operating systems. I'm pretty sure Linux should work, as it still has drivers for ancient sound cards in the kernel. Windows 11 still technically supports the ISA bus, but special drivers would need to be written. If I have any Windows driver experts in my audience, then please get in touch. Finally, I want to try some other ISA cards, especially video cards. I haven't been able to get any working so far, but I haven't really taken a proper look at it yet. I think it would be cool to get like a CGA or Hercules monitor working on this thing, so uh, hopefully it's possible. I should also point you in the direction of another project that's kind of similar to this project called SBEMU. It's a software emulation layer for ISA sound cards that lets you run bare metal DOS games without all of this messing about with real sound cards. If I'm honest, it's a slightly more sensible solution to the problem of bare metal DOS gaming, so if you can't be bothered with all of this hardware shenanigans, then I highly recommend you give it a look. Anyway, if you want to know more about this project, check out my GitHub or this Vogon thread where there's a lot of discussion happening. Links to both can be found in the video description. Thanks very much for watching this video. If you liked it, give me a thumbs up, comment, subscribe, etc. And stay tuned for more crazy retro experiments. Goodbye! <laughs>